Amen. Thank you for that. Makes me think of what we've got coming up, which is Open House Sunday. Chance to care about someone else in life. I hope you grab some of those, uh, those flyers for Open House Sunday. They look great. Pastor Dylan did a tremendous job um, designing them for us. But they have Open House on the front, some balloons, gospel on the inside. you got cards, gospel tracks, and cards. And I hope that you take a whole stack of them. You look at those back tables. They are filled. They are filled with cards, invitations, and tracks. And I'd love those to be empty tonight after church tonight. You take them and uh, hand them out to those around you. There are people that need the Lord and they need people to care. All right, and we have the truth. We have the gospel which changes lives, which we believe and which we would say amen to. Amen? amen. We believe the gospel changes lives? Yes, sir. Hmm. wonder how far that belief goes. wonder if it hits the neighbor next door. wonder if it hits the, the co-worker. One of it hits just a random street. And so I'm excited about what God wants to do at Open House Sunday, May the 19th. And our phrase for that, for that service is pack this house. All right, we're not going to call the numbers in anywhere. We're not going to say, hey, guess how many people were here at Open House Sunday? Because frankly, I don't care if anyone else ever knows. But I want to do our part. And those of you here were here Easter morning, you saw this place packed out. Not for the sake to say, boy, we had a good Easter, e Easter service so that we could say we had the chance to give the gospel to a number of people who wouldn't have heard, a, heard it otherwise. And I'm excited for May 19th at 10 o'clock in the morning that uh, this place, Lord willing, be packed out because the good Christians, the First Baptist Church, cared enough and loved the Lord enough to go invite somebody and invite them a couple times maybe and remind them, and maybe even just bug them just a little bit. They say, oh, but how I could never do that. I could never do that. You ever been approached at your house by someone from Hanson's? Anybody, unfortunately, ever make the mistake like I have actually talking to them? <laughs> All right. And they're like, there's a hot lead here. Oh, boy. Now I'm not saying we're going to be like Hanson's. We're not. But some of you are, the, are, 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 are not even easy to get rid of. All right. You're not even there yet. You look at them, they like, and, they, and they blink. You're like, oh, they must hate the gospel. Man, you give them a tract. Listen, if they won't come, that's all right, but we're going to do our part. We're going to do our part. So open out Sunday, May 19th. Make sure you grab some of those. I got some pads of paper to, to, um, to hand out. Pastor Ryan, I appreciate your help. Don't worry about that. It's just a microphone. And uh, they make more of those every day. I just hope I don't have to buy more every day. Three pads of paper, a, paper, a bright pink one to make phone calls for Open House, a blue one if you can help in an area on May 18th, Open House weekend 19th, and a green one is for the men to work in the nursery next Sunday morning on Mother's Day for the Mother's Day brunch. And men, here's what will happen. If we don't have enough men sign up, we're going to start calling through. We're going to start calling through the pages of the... Uh, uh, of, of the church directory. He said, aha, you're going to start with the A's. I may or I may not. I may find people that I don't like that day. I'm calling the phone and say, oh, we got a spot for you. It's with the toddlers. Oh, Brother Howell, I'm busy. And I'll say, well, will you pray about it for me? Don't you hate those words, pray about this? Because you know what the Lord's going to say. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm just kidding. But we're, we're, you're gracious. If you could sign up and help us out, we'd appreciate that very much. And then just a, a card here from the Thompsons, dear pastor and church family. Thank you so much for your prayer and cards. They were a great blessing and comfort during this time, or our time of grief with the passing of Johnny. God bless you. Thanks again, Dick and Nancy Thompson and family. So thanks, church family. You are a wonderful church family. And I've experienced that. My wife and I, we have someone pass, and, and, and you guys have just reached out. And you find out during those times what a family looks like. And this is a family. And it is a wonderful church family. I am privileged to be a part of this family right here. Now, thank you for that. So this Thompson say thank you as well. We'll have your Bibles, if you would, open to James chapter 5. I'm going to finish up tonight. James chapter 5, look at the very last two verses, verses 19 and 20. James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, a, a truth that I reference sometimes, but a truth that is hard for us. This is a hard truth. The truth, I think, is that it's very necessary, not just because it's in the Bible. I mean, any truth in the Bible is a necessary truth. Amen? When the Bible says something, we ought to live it and ought to do it. Amen? Amen. Good. Remember that when we finish this sermon tonight. It's a necessary truth. It's a truth that we don't always like to face because it takes us out of our comfort zone. I don't know about you, but, but most people do not like to be outside of their comfort zone. 
Now that can look different for different people. So for some of you, being up here in the pulpit would be so far out of your com comfort zone, you would rather die first. Literally, physically, completely. Other people, if I said, hey, the pulpit's open, you wouldn't shut up for the next hour and a half. <laughs> different comfort zone. Uh, for, for some people, grabbing a tract, hanging it out, is, is way outside the comfort zone. Other of you think nothing about grabbing 10,000 tracks and hitting as many people as you can. And, and, and for others, the comfort zone may look like singing or working in a particular ministry or whatever it may be. But, but this one, pretty universally, this particular truth is pretty universally outside of all of our comfort zones. And this particular truth is, is not one that, that very many, maybe a very, very, very small percentage it'd be inside their wheelhouse. But, but most of us, this truth is outside of the comfort zone. But it's a very necessary truth. Also, it's very necessary for the church and for the operation of the church. We're a family. It's been said that, that sometimes that, that this is, is supposed to be like a spiritual hospital, is it not? Where, where we help the wounded. Someone can come to church and, and maybe not be right with their Savior. We try to help them heal that relationship. They may not be right with their, with their spouse. We try to help them heal that, build that bridge and heal that relationship. They may not be in a right place and, well, with, their, with, the, with their kids and, and with their parents. They try to heal that. And they may not be right on the inside. There may be some struggles internally or, or mentally. We try to help them heal that relationship, right? Like a spiritual hospital. And for sure, we don't want to shoot the wounded at church. Do, we don't, do we? And that would be a terrible thing for a hospital to do. Someone comes in, they're sick, and boom, Next. It would keep open beds in the hospital, but it would not bring a lot of people to the hospital. Sometimes churches are, are really good at shooting the wounded. I'm thankful to be a part of First Baptist Church where we can see wounded people be helped every single day. Across every ministry, all gamuts, all aspects of life. And we also don't want to neglect the wounded. You ever gone to a doctor's office and had to wait before? I mean, if you miss your appointment by two minutes, you have to wait six weeks to reschedule it. But it's nothing for you to sit there for an hour and a half while, the, while they make you wait, right? Sometimes you can feel neglected. I remember a few years back, my daughter Danielle <clears throat> had allergic reaction. Now that's near and dear to my heart because my brother, my brother Joseph, grew up with some very severe allergies, allergies to peanuts and to, to bee venom. Uh, so severe that, that after he was stung once, the, the doctor said that if he got stung again, we were not to drive him to the ER. We were supposed to call the ambulance right away. It was that severe. Uh, like a matter of life and death. I remember the day that my brother Joseph got stung by a, D, uh, by a, by a bee while we're at Community Baptist of Saginaw. And I'm, I'm the soccer coach, and my brother, I think he's in eighth grade, gets stung by a bee. Shoved an EpiPen in his leg, epinephrine, and called the ambulance. Hold my brother, and I'm thinking, my brother's going to die in my arms. They got there. He was, he was okay. And, you know, I mean, he is a, a life debt to me, like a Wookiee, and uh, appreciate that. But I don't mess around with that stuff, with those allergies. They're, they're, not, they're, they're not areas you mess around with. And uh, I remember one time I heard here that somebody had a peanut allergy, and someone else said, well, that's just in your head. Okay, that's not in their head, all right? Uh, people can have very severe, they can die from those things. I was on an airplane once, and, and uh, someone on the plane had a, a, had a peanut allergy, and often on those planes, if they have a peanut allergy, they will ban the penis from the entire aircraft. These other people were complaining about that. Can you believe that? I can't even have peanuts on this aircraft. Like, that's the reason we fly for the peanuts. <laughs> but I couldn't sit idly by while I heard these people just run on their mouth out of sheer ignorance, and so I, of course, said something about that, something along the lines of, I'm sure glad we can protect someone's life. It's a lot more important than a bag of peanuts. And I wasn't the most popular person, but I spoke the truth. But I remember a couple years back when my, my daughter had an allergic reaction to a couple things, and her face swelled up in a very grotesque way, and I was in there, and my wife was a little worried about what I would say. She's worried because, you know, normally as a dad, whatever happens, dads say, that's no big deal. Don't worry about it. Honey, there, here's their arm. No big deal. That'll be fine. So that's not what dads are like. Well, the minute I saw Danielle, I, I stopped the conversation, threw in the back of my, my vehicle, and started driving over the speed limit to, to the emergency room. All the way I'm talking to her to make sure, and she's a little bit raspy. I remember that as I, as I pulled up the emergency room there at Covenant, 
and jumped out of the vehicle I was in and, and grabbed Danielle. When the, when the valet guy saw Danielle's face, it was, very, it was, it was swollen and grotesque. Her, her mouth had swollen or her throat was swelling. Um, he, said, he said, I'll park the car. As I walk inside, I've never had this happen before. I walked in the emergency room and, and the people there at the desk saw me walk in. There are people in there already. As I walked in, they, they said, come here and, and wave me right past everyone else in my way. All right? And I never stopped moving until I put Danielle down on the, on the bed in the, in the ER. Uh, they said, walked here. They opened doors. The automatic doors opened up. They pushed me here, pushed me here. And I just carried her right there. Within about a minute, we were inside, and she was within about two minutes hooked up to IVs. They didn't neglect the wounded. But you come to church sometimes, and someone's hurting, and, and sometimes we neglect it because we don't know what to say. It's kind of awkward. Hi? How are you? Oh, yeah, terrible. I forgot. And so we don't say anything at all, which is not good. Or we say some blundering, idiotic phrase to them. We've probably all been recipients of that at church before. Someone who means well begins to talk, and, and you, in your mind you think, okay, just stop. Okay, okay, stop now. Okay, really stop now. But this particular truth deals with wounded people. There's a term in, in psychology called the bystander effect. It, retur it refers to the phenomenon in which the greater number of people present, the less likely people are to help a person in distress. The, the greater number of people around, then, then the less likely that any one person will stop and see what is wrong. I would submit to you that it happens in a church all of the time. There are people with very real needs, very real hurts. And if we're not careful, we will become just a bystander. We'll think, well, someone else will take care of that. Someone else will take that responsibility. I don't have to. James Plays chapter like 5. Street. James gives us this last truth before he closes down the book. He says this, brethren... If any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this time. Lord, I pray that you would guide us, you would direct us during this time. Lord, that you would convict our hearts that you would correct areas and thoughts in our life that are not pleasing to you. Lord, I pray for this particular truth, the one where we see problems and must confront. And I pray you'd help us to be honest before you. In Jesus' name, amen. The title for the message tonight is, Help Me. Help Me. Now, I won't always do this. I don't typically do this. I don't think I've ever done this before. But I found a little video that I think will help illustrate this bystander effect. It was on YouTube, believe it or not. If we can get that video up, they're going to play it in about 38 seconds, and I'll, I'll stop it now. I'll, I'll keep my mic on, and I'll stop it right there. But watch what happens when someone's hurt. Experiment done in London, they'll talk about done in London by some psychologists and what the crowd does. For commuters. Uh, uh, Unknown to these uh, passersby, Peter is an actor. Uh, As part of an experiment on bystander apathy, he's pretending to be ill. Help. Help. Uh, How long before he gets help? Help. Help me, Please help. Helping would be inconvenient or even risky. He lies there for more than 20 minutes and no one raises an eyebrow. Please, somebody help me. It's always very distressing to watch situations like this where people are obviously suffering and no one's actually helping them. But what we have here is two conflicting rules. One is the rule we ought to help and the other is the rule that we ought to do what everybody else is doing. And here you have a, a group of, effectively a group of strangers who are exerting the pressure not to intervene, not to help, and it's very difficult to rebel.
Ruth, another actor, takes Peter's place. How long before she receives help? Four minutes later, and 34 people have passed without stopping. Well, people don't really want to know that they just haven't got the time. Well, they have got the time, they just don't want to get involved. Unwittingly, these strangers have silently formed a temporary group with a rule, don't get involved. They're afraid to stand out from the crowd and won't take action if no one else does. This woman has clearly spotted Ruth, but she conforms to the rule and does nothing. Can you stop right there? Watch what happens, though, when someone... Can you believe that? That first man was laying there for over 20 minutes. This person, 34 people walked past, and, and yet no one would help. Yet I'd submit, as we look at this passage, that this happens a whole lot more often among Christians. If you look there in James chapter 5, we'll go back to the notes on the screen if we could, gentlemen. Thank you so much for that. I want to notice, first of all, the people of this passage starts off in James chapter 5, verse 19, the very first word. Would you help me out? What is that first word? One more time. What's the first word? Brethren. Who are the brethren? Us, Christians, right? Those who claim the name of Jesus Christ, those who are saved. James, as he finishes up this particular book, this epistle, he is very clear to, to point out in this last point, so we're not confused, he's talking, first of all, to Christians. He says, brethren. So if you're a Christian, you fall under this last truth. If you've accepted Christ as your Savior, whether you're two or 102, you fall under this title of brethren. He's talking to Christians, those who have, who have accepted Christ as their Savior. He's also though, talking to the careless. He says, brethren, if any of you, if any of you. Have you ever known a Christian to make a mistake? Yes or no? Have you ever been guilty of a mistake yourself? Absolutely. Last time I checked, there are no perfect people left on earth. The last one left around 2,000 years ago, and he's coming back again. But there's no one else left around who's perfect. As goes, he says, brethren, if, if any of you, if, if one of you he does this thing, uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, but by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace bestowed, which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. Also, I see in this, in this passage the P Christian, the careless, and I see the concerned. We're looking for someone in this passage to, to be concerned, to have a heart. If we were to watch that video again, and as I watched it a couple times after I got this particular this, this sermon road, and I came stumbled across that video. After I watched it the first time or second time, I began to watch the people in it. And I had this thought, I wonder if they ever watched this video and watched themselves walk by. Wouldn't you be embarrassed if you saw yourself walk by? Oh, look at that. That was Pastor Ryan. You could hear, you could hear the, the words go through the auditorium, right? If that was you in that video, you'd be ashamed of yourself, would you not? If there's any person in this room that thought, oh boy, 34 people. I, probably most of us thought this, man, if I was there, I would have stopped. Right? Did you not kind of have those thoughts? I, I, I would have been, as soon as I saw that person, I would have went over to him. We won't watch it, but at the end, the, the man at the beginning, I believe his name was Nathan, at the very end of the video, he lays back down, but this time he wears a suit coat and tie. It takes about 20 seconds or so for someone to stop and help him. But when he was there in jeans and a jacket, no one, they said, ever really stopped to help him. We're looking for someone who's concerned. I would say this, that the blatant, the blatant lack of concern for fellow Christians reveals the unchecked self-love that we possess. The blatant lack of concern for fellow Christians reveals the blatant or reveals the unchecked self-love that you and I possess. We love ourselves more than we love other people. There's a concern that's supposed to be there in this passage where we look and we say, there's a problem. Not only is the people in this passage, I see the perilousness. He says, brethren, if any of you do err 
from the truth. From the truth. That's an interesting phrase, the truth. I would say that if someone erred from the truth, that'd be, first of all, pretty serious. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't be serious if someone erred from, from truth? Yes or no? I, I, I think so. Because if they're erring from truth, they're making, a, they're making a, rather, a rather big mistake. The problem is we confuse this passage of truth with what we believe truth to be. For instance, we say that like this, boy, if someone dresses differently, boy, they're, they're off the deep end. And I believe the Bible does teach a, 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 some things in that. We're going through that on Wednesday nights with, with the discipleship series. We'll deal with that probably a couple weeks from now. Now, God's designed for dress. But if someone gets their hair a little bit too long and it's some man, we're like, oh boy, there they are. Boy, losing it. In their church, they use music that we're not going to use here at First Baptist Church. Amen? Yes. Maybe you missed what I said. They're going to use music in their church that we are not going to use here at First Baptist Church. Yes. Okay. But, but we're like, oh boy, boy, they're just, man, they're, they're gone. They're gone. And, and, and perhaps so. But that's not what this word truth is referring to in James chapter 5. It's serious because I'm recalled in my mind of a passage of Scripture in John chapter 14 verse 6. It's a familiar passage, a familiar verse, that when I begin the verse, you will finish it for me. Or you'll be able to in your mind. Remember that James is the half-brother of our Lord. He was converted, I believe, later on because at first, when he was in the house, I think the scripture teaches us that his own family did not have honor, give him respect. A prophet had no honor in his own country. So it was a little bit after that that James, the half-brother of our Lord, converted. But no doubt he knew about this passage. He was a leader of the church in Jerusalem, one of the forefathers. And this familiar verse in John chapter 14, verse 6 says this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This is serious not because someone may use slightly different music. It's serious because what James is saying is someone is erring from the truth. Jesus is the truth, so what is in essence happening is that this person is saying, I see where Jesus is, and I choose to go this way. I see who the truth is. I am the way, the truth. I see where he is. I see what that truth is, and I choose to do it my way. I see what he has asked me to do, and I've said, no, do err, do remove, do wander. So that word means from the truth. He errs from this. He wanders from this. I see where Jesus is at, and I'm going to walk over here. It's serious because as I look at it in this perspective, I now have a fellow believer, a fellow Christian, one that I would call a family member, a brother or a sister in Jesus Christ, who now says, who has now said with their life and their choices, I don't want that part of Jesus in my life. How can I sit idly by if someone says, I don't want this part of Jesus in my life? The problem is people sit idly by every single day. Hey, we make different excuses. Well, you know, it's not my problem, and, and I wouldn't do that if I were them. And, and boy, it's not a good thing. It's not going to end up well, but, but, but I'm not going to deal with it. I'm not going to talk to them about it because, oh boy, that'd be outside my comfort zone. Hey, it's, their, it's their life. It's their life. It's not my life. And, and they're making horrible mistakes. The problem is, not only do we not talk to them about it, we talk to everybody else about it. It's called gossip. You may know the Bible word for that. Never about, talked about in a positive sense in Scripture, gossip. In fact, talked about as a sin in the Scripture. Well, did you hear about so-and-so, hear what they're doing? Well, it's just so you can pray for them correctly. <laughs> yes, that's how we pray correctly with all the juicy information. Just enhances our prayer lives. Before long, this person who's, who's turned their back on Jesus Christ, who has wandered from the truth, is now castigated from the family. Not because because we've put them under church discipline, but because we've moved them aside because we don't want to be concerned about it. It is a serious peril. The perilousness is serious. They've wandered from the truth. It is, it is sad. It is sad. It's sad because when it break your heart is someone you love steps away from Jesus Christ. That's sad. 
Do we not believe what we say we believe? Do we not believe that Jesus does bring true joy? Do we believe that? Do, do we believe that there is really no true peace apart from Jesus Christ? Do we not believe that he is the only way to heaven? Do we not believe that his way is really the best way? Do we believe that or not? I think we believe it. Do, we say we believe it. Yet when someone around us maybe walks the other way, oh well, oh where's that concern? Where's that? It's also, it's simple. It's serious, it's sad, and it's simple. It's simple in this aspect. Are they going to turn back to Jesus Christ or not? It's simple in the fact of, here's the choice you have to make. Do you want to have the truth in your life, or do you want to turn away from it? Do, do you want the truth to, to affect you? Do you want the truth to, to, to move you and change you? Or do you want to just keep on walking away from it? Someone once said that they appreciate honest people. So if someone's going to walk away from Jesus Christ, you might as well get a t-shirt out with a marker and say, I don't like Jesus. Well, that's in essence what you're doing. It's a simple truth. The question I'd ask you is, how much poison would you let your children ingest? I looked at an article today about the, the cities that are shrinking the fastest in the United States. Hate to say it, but Saginaw, we made the list. So did Flint and Bay City. Who knew? But we weren't number one. All right, wow, I know, right? On the article on Flint, they talked about one of the reasons for the exodus of Flint. They're, they're pointing, uh, pointing it back to the water crisis and the lead water. They said that's the reason everyone has, has left Flint. We know it to be maybe a factor, but people left Flint long before that reason, okay? And there's a whole lot more reasons to leave Flint than water. In fact, I was at the Starbucks when that was going on in Birch Run, and a man from Canada came up to me. He goes, is it safe to drink coffee here? Just like that. And I said, yes. He said, well, you know, the Flint and the water, and I don't know if this was safe here in Birch Run, if it's safe here. I said, oh, different water source for sure, for sure. You know, then I walked out and went somewhere else for coffee. No, no, I didn't. I didn't. How much poison would you let your kids invest? How many pit vipers would you allow your toddler to have in their crib? Only one, Pastor Howell, only one. No child needs more than one pit viper in their, in their crib. How much peanut butter would you give to a peanut allergy-laden person? How much rejection of Jesus will you turn a blind eye to in fellow believers? How much rejection of Jesus? Well, it, well, it's not really a big deal. Yeah, it is. They're rejecting Jesus. It's not my problem. Sure it is. James makes it your problem. I see the perilousness, but then I see the plan. The plan. The Bible says this, James says this, and one convert him. I see two words here in this passage that I want to bring out. I see a, a, a reformation, reform. Proverbs chapter 9 says, Rebuke a wise man, he will, be, he will love thee for it. He'll be wiser. We're looking to reform somebody. Bring them back to the were. When you reform it, you bring it back. You reform. You bring again. You make bring again the form that it once had. You reform it. Someone who was a vibrant and love with Jesus Christ Christian, you're bringing back to that point. You're reforming them. Matthew chapter 5 deals specifically with this, that if a brother has a problem with you, you're supposed to try to rectify it. So that if someone has a problem and it's with me, I should try to rectify that with them. And Matthew chapter 18 says this, that if you have a problem with another brother, you're supposed to try to rectify it too. In both situations, whether I have a problem with you or you have a problem with me, the responsibility is on me. Like, well, that's not fair. Where's their responsibility? I don't know. The Bible doesn't talk about that. It talks about my responsibility. I'm supposed to try to reform them. I want to I convert them. And, the, and I love the second word, to restore them. That's what Galatians 6, 1, to restore one another, not repel them. See, we missed the point. We're judge, jury, and executioner. I know what's going on in your heart right now. I know why you're doing this. No, you don't. No, I don't. What I do know, it appears that you've walked away from Jesus. I want to try to restore you. I've never done this, but I've floated the idea of trying to restore an old vehicle. I think it'd be fun. I'm probably crazy. Talking to my boys about this, and you know, maybe one day we'll, we'll get a vehicle and try to, try to do this. I've known some people to do this, and, and they're so patient with the project, aren't they? 
They, they, they diligently served. I ran to a guy the other day who was looking for a part for a, an old Thunderbird. And you know, I was at a shop and he, he came in and said, hey, I'm looking for this, maybe it was a 66 something Thunderbird and some back door. A back door. I've been looking for this and, and you know, and the guy said, well, I'll be on the lookout. It may take me here. No, that's no problem. Whenever you get it, just call me. He didn't care how long it took. Isn't that the kind of attitude we ought to have at First Baptist Church? Not that we're excusing things wrong, but I'm trying to restore it. I'm trying to show a little patience. All right? And so, you know, if someone doesn't change in the first 15 seconds, I wish they would. I wish they would. But if it takes a minute, that'll be okay. I'm trying to restore them. I'm not giving up on them. I'm not neglecting them. I'm not going to shoot the wounded. I'm going to stay after the wounded. But, but, the, but the plan is to convert them, to bring them back, to reform and to restore. What it looks like is this, is I, if I see someone that I believe is now separating themselves from Jesus Christ, I ought to go to that person by myself, not on Facebook. Not on Facebook. You don't put on Facebook, well, I can't believe the people that do this. What? Yeah, I, I've looked through my whole Bible and I've not seen that's a, a, a way to solve a problem. I, I've not seen that. Hmm. I've seen it some other things. It's a different sermon though that's coming up. I go to that person and maybe you say it like this. Hey, you know, Brother Jared, can I have a serious conversation with you? Brother Jared may say, you know what? No, I don't want to talk to you. He may say that. What should I do then? Punch him in the face? I'm just... <laughs> Go talk to everybody else about it. Or maybe I go back and pray and say, God, you need to open this door up. How about that option instead? I say, Brother Jerry, serious conversation. You know what normally happens? A person says yes. You say, hey, this is on my heart. I've noticed this. I've noticed you're making these choices. I'm concerned about you. You know, if you go with that spirit of meekness, as the Bible in Galatians chapter 6 talks about, you know what often will happen? The restoration process begins immediately. Now, you don't always see it at first. Sometimes a person responds this way. Oh, you know what? Get out of my face. Okay. Concerned about you. But what you can't see is that God's starting to do a work right here. God's starting to do a work right here. Has someone ever confronted you about something and, and you argued with, but as you walked away, you said, eh, it's probably true a little bit. Or more or less, like this, it's not true at all, it's ridiculous, they're wrong. Five minutes later, well, they're not completely wrong, they're just mostly wrong. They're, okay, they're not mostly wrong, but they're, they're still wrong. <sighs> okay, I, I, I'm not going to tell them they're right. You know what, and, and then the Lord does something right here. Why? Because maybe someone had the spirit of restoration back here. Brethren, if one of you do err from the truth and one convert him, one convert him. The plan is to restore them. To say, listen, come back to Jesus Christ. Because I believe like I thought you believed, this is the best place. Because I believe like I thought you said amen to, that you'll find true peace right here. That he's the only way. Come back. And you know what? I'll help you come back. Sometimes it takes that to have someone come back to church. Hey, you know, we'd love to have you back at First Baptist Church. You know what? When you come, I'd love to sit with you. You know, it's hard sometimes when people come back to First Baptist Church because they wonder what people will say about them because they haven't been here. And every once in a while, someone says something dumb. More often than not, what, what do we say? Man, it's great to see you, right? But people's minds, that's not what's going to happen. They're going to walk in the back door. People are going to be like, oh, I know what they've been doing. And I'm thankful we don't have a church largely like that at all. I want to have a place that's, a, that's about restoration. That's what James is talking about. The last thing he says is this, the prophet. The prophet. There's a rescue. We're in the rescue business. James says this in, in verse 20. Interesting. At the end of the verse, he says, Let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way. Now remember, that's not a sinner who's unsaved. We already established this is talking to Christians. Shall save a soul from death. It's interesting phraseology that James would use. It would make sense if that were an unsafe person, but we know clearly because of verse 19, this is not talking about unsafe people. So why does James say that if, if you do this, if you con confront somebody in the spirit of meekness and restoration, try to bring them back, you save a soul from death. 
That means that they're going to save them in salvation? Well, they're already saved. I would submit this, that often death includes in the Bible separation. When someone has turned their back on Jesus, they've been separated. They've been dead spiritually. You can't turn your back on Jesus and expect to prosper, and expect to live a spirit-filled life. It's impossible. You can't have one area where you turn your back on Jesus and expect every other area not to be infected by that. It doesn't work that way. And James says you can rescue somebody physically, spiritually. I would wager even that there is also the physical sense of that, of that phrase, save a soul from death. In a very real way, there are people who have been saved from a literal, physical death because of life choices, from coming back to Jesus, where, where they would have ended up physically dead, except Jesus got involved, except Jesus absolutely transformed their life. Christians as well. So how high are the stakes? It is a matter of life and death. That's how high it is. Well, it's not my problem. I'm not going to worry about it. No, no, it is your problem. You ought to worry about it. Just don't talk about it. The rescue and the redeeming hide a multitude of sins. You know, I don't find anywhere in this passage that we get to, to proclaim what is done. But we get to cover what is done. Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 13 that love covers. Beareth all things, hopeth all things, believeth all things. It's easy to share the juicy things. But it's spiritual to let love cover those things. It's spiritual to say, you know what? You've come back to Jesus Christ, and I am so glad. Here's a principle. Sometimes I know things about 16 years that I would rather know or not know. I'm thankful that I'm able to offer forgiveness cover things sometimes. Not in the bad sense, not in the, in the don't deal with things, but in the sense of, hey, we're done. This is over. It's not going to be held against your account any longer. And that's exactly what James is talking about. What he means is, Christian, fellow Christian, when someone comes to church and you interact with Christians, it's not the time to rehearse all the wrongs that have ever been done in life. It's time to release it. Or if I can, in the the song, let it go. Cover it. See, James says, it's a big deal. It's a matter of life and death. But he says, brethren, if you do this, you'll hide the multitude of sins. Say, Brother Howell, that's way outside my comfort zone. It's outside my comfort zone, too. He say, you, Pastor Howell? Sure. You, you, you think I would ever enjoy talking to somebody about a serious issue like that in life? I mean, if you do, can I submit this? I, I submit you got a problem if you enjoy that. But it's necessary. Necessary. Sure for me as, as a pastor, for sure. But this passage doesn't say pastor, does it? Doesn't say Sunday school teacher, does it? Does it say mom or dad? Does it say that? No. It says brethren, Christian, and I hope that we're a church who won't let the fellow Christian turn their back on Jesus Christ, but who will address it, not publicly, not on Facebook, but address it with a spirit of meekness to restore. And what will happen? You save a soul from death and hide a multitude of sins. Good things always happen when they come back to Jesus. He can make all things become new. And that's the kind of church I think God would have us have. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that you consistently and constantly bring us truth from your word. Lord, I pray you'd help us to be cognizant of this fact. Lord, we don't want to be just a bystander and walk past. Lord, we need your wisdom. One who would say, Pastor Howell, as you spoke, God's touched my heart. 
Would you pray for me? I want to be that kind of fellow Christian to my, to my family. I mean, my Christian family. I, it's easy to ignore. It's easy to say it's not my problem. Would you pray for me? I, I want to be the kind of Christian. Amen. 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 God touched my heart tonight. Would you pray for me? Amen. Amen. Hands all over. Amen. 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 You say, preacher, pray for me. I didn't raise my hand before, but I'll raise it now. I, I don't want to just ignore it. I know I shouldn't. It's tough, but would you pray for me? Who else? Amen. 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 In just a minute, the piano will play.